Gamers Podcast. Five Pillars of Mad Monarch Production. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, and the foes out there, because we know you exist. I welcome to another episode of the Blood Brothers Podcast with your host, Dili Hussein. This is a continuation of the collaborative podcast in uh, partnership with United Islam Awareness Week with five MSAs from Western Canada in Vancouver, Burnaby, Regina, Saskatoon and Calgary. May Allah bless you all for your great collaborative initiative. I mean, your mm. And I am with a co-speaker, someone who had the honour of meeting uh, late last year, and that is none other than Sheikh Muhammad Yaffa. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. So far, so good. Jet lagged? A little bit, and the changing of um, um, different places from from hotel to hotel is making it difficult to sleep. Like I mentioned earlier. Well, the beds are nice. The yeah, are. you know, it's uh, uh, the the bed. It, it's uh, uh, apparently it's not the bed that does it. Okay. It's the mind. Oh really? Yeah. So the comfort of the bed is more aesthetic. It's something else. You know what? It is good to have a comfortable bed if mm-hmm. the beds were not uh, as comfortable as they were. I I wouldn't I, I wouldn't be having any sleep at all. <laughs> so now I'm having less sleep. Um, I, when I saw the beds, I said, oh, subhanAllah, you know, you go into this, you know, you, it's just cozy, you're going to sleep, uh, you're going to sleep off, but it's just not happening that way. So, but Alhamdulillah, nothing to complain about. Um, this is, this is part of life. It's not a difficult thing, yeah. but it's just, you know, just because you ask. Yeah. So we've, we've, we've had a busy week and we still got a busy week ahead of us. And the theme of your talks, uh, at the universities for UIAW is Triple threat. Yep. Now, for those who are wrestling fans and who watch WWE, triple threat is a kind of fighting between three wrestlers. But I'm assuming that's not what you're referring to. No, I'm not wrestling. Okay. So, so, so what is the triple threat? <laughs> so the, the, the tri- triple uh, threat, I, I don't know if it's a misnomer or if it's a good way of naming it. It's just being, uh, being Muslim, being black and being immigrant. So uh, these are all attributes that uh, if you have them in Canada, you're always looking over your shoulder uh, because we know Canada is one of it's one of the best places to, to, to live in. But still, there is a there is a bar that we need to hit when it comes to acceptance that we have not hit yet. What's that bar? Uh, that bar is uh, is total acceptance that we are all Canadians. Uh, so when when usually when people say uh, uh, bluntly, if, if a white Canadian say when we when we say Canadians, usually that doesn't include a, a, a black person. It doesn't include a Muslim. Uh, it doesn't include an immigrant. So um, normally when we speak politically or when we are conscious of it, we mean everybody. Mm. But at sometimes when people want to ground what Canadian is, some people think I am Canada. So. W- 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 the way I speak, uh, the way I conduct myself, what I say and the boundaries that I put and the laws that I believe in, those constitute what Canadian values are. What you are bringing is foreign, it's an incursion into what Canadians are. So um, um, so those things do, 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 do exist and we have to just own, own, own them and try to work around them. I'd humbly, I'd humbly even argue that what you just described as triple threat, if you were to perhaps remove black and just kept people of color, right? Or, or let's just maintain black or non-Caucasian. The same applies in the UK. The same applies in France and most parts of Europe. Many constituencies in America pride themselves that a true American is a wasp, white, Anglo-Saxon and Protestant, right? So then when you're now engaging with MSAs, how do we overcome this triple threat? Because many Muslims or many people who fall into those categories may suffer from an inferiority complex, may suffer from identity issues, um, a plethora of, 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 of negative impacts, right? How do you overcome this triple threat? It's, it's very difficult to overcome. And I was asked that question today. And um, uh, so the reason I mentioned, uh, I, I'm, I'm sticking with black and I'm going to go with that because the black people within the East Muslim community as well, sometimes there is that, uh, there is some tension because- Anti-black racism? Well, it's, it's, uh, to, some, to, some, to, some, uh, to some extent, but it's not really grounded in that. It's, it's lack of understanding black people and everybody Muslim or non-Muslim are buying to the, um, uh, the, the picture of who a black man is that, that's been portrayed uh, what, on, what, in the media. What is that and that, 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 that stereotype is that there is no culture, 
uh, there is no progress, uh, there, is, um, there is no leadership, and, and the, that the, the history of black people started with, with enslavement, which came when, when the, the truth is the Western enslavement of black people came to, uh, which happened around, uh, around the, uh, along the Atlantic, Atlantic coast, yeah. this, the, the, the transatlantic Atlantic slave trade. It happened about 700 years when West Africa was Muslim already. Yeah. Right? So, so you've, the, really, you've, you've met non-black Muslims who believe that there is no leadership, there is no culture, there is no heritage, there is no Islamic history. I've met black people that are frustrated that that is not out. Okay. And when you when you know that that's not out you and the the this big burden of making it known is just so hard. And when you meet people who are ignorant of that and they treat you as if you're nothing, it's something that's very very difficult on so, black people. So give me give me a brief overview of some of the things that you addressed during your people's talk. Um so I addressed the uh, the history of Islam in Africa. Uh, I started by saying that Islam came to Africa before it went to Medina. So the first Muslims, when they were persecuted, Abyssinia. they actually went to Abyssinia. But then I left that almost immediately because that was not the concentration of my talk and came to West Africa. And uh, the, the Ghana Empire, the Kingdom of Ghana, not present day Ghana, which is just named after the uh, uh, old Ghana. So where did the classical Ghanaian Empire, what, what land mass? The well, the, the Ghanaian Empire occupied places, uh, some some of Mali today, some of Niger, part of Mauritania, going down a little bit towards towards Senegal, if, if that. And then uh, between 300 and 1,000. And then the Almoravid from the north, Almoraviton. Al yes, yeah, so they came over and they stayed for about 200 years. But then the Malians uh, from Sunjata Keita took over and they established uh, uh, the Mali Empire, which was a Muslim empire. Mm -hmm. But the Ghana, the Ghana kings already had accepted Islam, but they never forced Islam on the people. Right, so that's why up till today you find Muslims and Christians and animists living together in West Africa. So this Islam didn't spread by by any means of, uh, of force. Sure, can I counter then? You know, you just said that the the Ghanaian kings who had accepted Islam didn't force Islam upon the people. Neither did the Malians. Are you then suggesting that perhaps the Arabs and the Turks did, or the Mughals did? No, I'm not saying, so what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is the perception is that Islam was spread by the sword, regardless of where, when and how. So uh, That certainly wasn't the case in many parts. Not, no, that, that certainly wasn't the case in many, many parts, yeah. right? Not in Medina, not in Abyssinia, not in West Africa, not in, not in Indonesia, Indonesia not, in not, in many, not in Malaysia, not in many, many parts of the world, mm. right? And in many places, even in Persia, the Prophet Muhammad wrote to... Uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he wrote to the Persian king and wrote to many kings and said, I invite you to Islam. The Persian king ripped it. And according to other versions, actually, they killed the messenger. Mm. That is a diplomatic uh, aggression, mm. right? So, and, and even when, when Muslims either defended themselves or, or fighting against aggression, when they took over, they never imposed themselves upon the people. Because in Persia, um, uh, some Persians were actually marrying their nieces, which is totally against Islamic law. Mm. Uh, but the, the scholars were wondering what to do with that when they were in power. So if, it, if, if they wanted to force Islam on those people, they would have said, it's not happening here. Just like in Canada here, there are certain marriages, nobody will sign it, mm. right? So they would not have not signed, so they would not, it, it would not have been debated. Does that means to digress, how did the ulama overcome that then? Well, the ulama, they talked about it. Um, for, I, 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 somehow it... It, it faded off because Islam, actually, the power of Islam ruled not the power, meaning physical power, but the, the presence of it and the, the influence. Uh, the, the influence. The yes, exactly. And it didn't start there. It started in Medina. Mm. The Wathiqa was written when the Prophet wasallam moved to Medina. Yeah. He, he had the Wathiqa written between him, the Jews, and the pagans. And that was the first, actually, a political constitution ever written in the history of mankind mm. that, that talked about uh, diversity, unity, uh, moral values, protecting the state, protecting everybody's rights, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so that happened there, it happened in Persia, it happened in West Africa as well. Although the kings were the ones who were in power, they never imposed themselves on the people. That is why when the people were enslaved and were brought here, mm -hmm. they were Muslims, but they were also non-Muslims, although Islam had been there for 700 years before the enslavement period. Mm -hmm. That's because there was no force for people to, to really turn to uh, to become to become Muslims when yeah. they didn't choose. Now, be, now before we do it, because the crux of this podcast yeah. will be yeah. African Black Islamic history. That's right. But before I get to that, 
So when you were, or when you have been engaging with the MSAs for UIAW, being black Muslim and immigrant, um, what kind? So besides the kind of historical aspect of yeah. it, yeah, and, and 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 the kind of, I'm going to say alleged whitewashing. That's right. Because I want you to substantiate that later on the podcast, sure. right? For the sake of a robust mm-hmm. discussion. How so, so? So in theme of radical Islamic honesty, because that's the theme yeah. of the UIAW. That's right. How? How? So what do you do there? So 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 that was just a historic background for the black people, mm. and then I, I I talk about what integration is in Islam. And uh, explain Islam, first of all, is the worship of one creator, right? We are all wired to worship. Whether you worship under under the name of a religion or not, you worship something. You put your life out for something. The there is something. Instinct. Yes, that is that is just that is just part of us. Fitra. So what Islam is saying is that instead of you worshiping all of these things that may go someday, you worship Allah, mm. and that Muhammad is the messenger for by all kinds of uh, 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 miracles. Even even just people being able to memorize a book that is almost the size of the New Testament mm. when they don't speak the language, you'll have to put a gun to somebody's head to say, "I teach." you just how to read German Mm. and then you have to memorize this size of a book in in German Mm. you have to kill them Mm. but Allah said in the Quran that we have made this Quran easy for remembering now in the days of the of of the early Muslims they would not know what that means because they were Arabs but if you go to uh, Pakistan and Africa and other places and you find a 12 year old Memorizing this kind of a vo- voluminous book yeah. in a language that is not their language, yeah. that can only be interpreted as miracle and yeah. karama, right? So, um, uh, yeah, so so I touched on 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 those on those things in 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 my talk. But when when you when you come when 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 you talk about integration in Islam, and you look about uh, you look at integration the way we we look at it here. Uh, people claim integration, but actually, some people want want Muslims and Black people and that to assimilate. So, so for our viewers and listeners, yeah. and this is this is a very important issue that I'm, I'm glad increasing number of ulama and du'at and addresses. What is the difference between assimilation and integration? Because I would humbly yeah. argue yeah. that many Muslim diaspora communities have successfully integrated. Yes, but there's an expectation to assimilate what's the difference well I- integration is the existence of different of of, of different elements together mm. without one being dissolving the other right now assimilation is uh, is 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 cultural forgetfulness as you come here you do as the romans do and the romans meaning anybody who has established themselves so the so the minority mm. must dissolve within the majority Forced conformity this definitely they have to conform mm. right so um uh that that's that's the difference and islam like all of the uh, all throughout history mm. islam actually valued uh integration so you hear as long as you don't break laws your rights are protected mm. Right, and if you break laws, also there is no transgression in 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 the in the in the punitive uh, process that that takes place. I so, think that's fair. Oh, oh def- definitely, that's fair. That, that's fairness. To pay taxes and obey the law of the land, and not to raise arms against a country or a state that gives you security, is a fair expectation for your citizens. Surely, if we don't think that was fair, we'll not be living here. Okay. Right? Then, so then, why is there? Why is there systemic expectation in the Western world? Because what you've just described in Canada. And our British and European viewers and listeners are going to think, well, that's also happening here. Yeah. Why does there seem to be a systemic uh, campaign mm. to make Muslims specifically assimilate? So I, I believe there is a sense of supremacy because when people think my culture is better than yours, then you have to listen, uh, 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 f- follow mine. That's one. Second is this is it's fear. Right. So people are afraid that if they allow people to or others to keep their culture, that might actually uh, infringe. Yes, exactly. It, well, it, it might infringe in their own culture and they will dissolve. Okay. So this fear of self-preservation, of cultural preservation. So, 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 the, so the enablers may see it from an existential point of view? That's right. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's it. And the other thing is, is, is the economics, because this, this society is all about freedom, economics, alienation i don't want to i don't want to do to 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 stay out i want to be part of it and i see this as a threat to me 
so these are the reasons why they really want people. So I, I think in some ways it's human instinct that you want to preserve your own kind. Survival. Yeah, well, yes. It, it's, it's survival, but sometimes it goes to the extreme. People really don't look at it reasonably okay. because the Muslims that come here. So you, first of all, so, so language is the container of culture. Mm. So somebody is speaking your language and sometimes in their homes they're speaking your language and they forget their own language. Mm. Pretty much that's a big portion of their culture gone. Finished. Right? Still, that's not sufficient. They're going to your schools, right? Which is, means they are going to be indoctrinated in your own ways. The, and so the children also are, are gone. Right. And they're having a lot of conflicts in our homes, as you know, Muslim homes. Everybody's trying to keep their culture. Still is not enough. And if you gather together and you want to speak your language, it becomes a problem also publicly. So um, so it's 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 a hard thing to deal with. It's so, a hard thing to deal so, with. So let me let me play the kind of articulate white supremacist here. Yeah? That's right. What are you guys doing in our country? Then? If you want to preserve your language and preserve your culture and preserve your faith and preserve your values, what are you doing here? It's a global world, first of all. Yeah. And um, many of us uh, came here because we think we could contribute. And some of us came here because there is there is uh, problems that are happening in those countries. And nobody is innocent mm -hmm. because many of those countries don't produce their own weapons, <laughs> right? We take the weapons and sold them there and pay taxes to this government. So we have to take some responsibility. So you're talking that the countries that um, immigrant community is Africa, Asia, and the Arab world, that in fact they're coming from countries which have been destabilized by the very countries that we seek in citizenship. Oh, definitely, definitely. It, it, it's a, it's it's just this. Service. Cool, right because um i don't i don't know when somalia somalia had a an industry of producing guns and nobody's asking where the guns are coming from Absolutely. that question is never asked yeah. right whether even boko haram nobody said where do they get those uh, heavy weapons they are not made in nigeria somebody's selling and when they sell they make profit they're paying taxes to some government and i'm assuming it's in the west mm. so we're partly responsible west or east for for, for what is happening mm. and therefore also according to international law uh refugee refugee laws and, and and integrating people into society so it's it's today is this side tomorrow it might be the other side so there is no way of stopping that we're going to be intermingling would you agree i mean we spoke about this on the way to the hotel earlier today that you know sometimes you know i, I don't like laying the blame on the state of the muslim majority or economically developing world always on european colonialism but it becomes difficult not to because it was only around less than 100 years ago, and I would even argue that there is still a neo-colonial system in place, that in the case of the United Kingdom, and you said, was it your father or your grandfather that fought for the French? Uh, it's my father who, fa who fought along the French and, he has and had, and had, and had a, a bullet in his hand. And he hasn't even been paid. No, he hasn't been paid, and we're still trying to pursue that, and I don't know how. So Africans, <laughs> Africans Arabs, Indians fought for the British and the French in World War One and in World War Two, right? And these were countries that were colonized. And then all of a sudden, there's a there's a there's a problem when the progeny of these people come over to those countries, where it's supposed to be all great and wonderful. And then there's questions asked about why we came to the country when they have been literally raped and looted by those respective countries. So it's difficult not to include the context of European colonialism. Do you think that's a fair assessment, or it's an unfair assessment? Well, uh, it's, it's part of the, it's, it's definitely, it's, cent it's central to the assessment itself. What is ironic is that since the, fin since the end of the World Wars mm. and the declaration of freedom of movement, that's when it became very difficult to move. <laughs> <All right? laughs> you, seriously, you have to have a passport and you have to have a visa and they could refuse you and giving you the visa doesn't guarantee you going into the country right and it's supposed to be freedom of movement so it's it's very convoluted how things happen and i remember um uh, being from sierra leone the sierra leoneans used to go to england w without visa when we got the war and we needed england that's when they imposed the war in 1994 right the, the very time when they were really needed and these are the people who came colonized the country, um, uh, colonized Freetown, uh, announced their protection uh, uh, over the rest of um, what is now Sierra Leone because they were afraid the French would get into, into that. So they had some agreement with the chiefs and, uh, and had a good relationship. The, 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 the biggest uh, diamond companies and so on are all paying, you know, uh, tribute to, to Britain. Mm. And uh, the British come whenever they want and live whenever they want. 
Um, and then when the Serenians needed them, they said, no, it's visa. Well, pretty much it was not we're going to impose visa. It's now we're going to stop you. But the word to stop you is to say now we impose visa, meaning we're not, if they don't give you visa, you're not going and they are not going to give you because now you need them, right? Now, before we move into uh, the kind of African history, Islamic history, right? What is then the, some of the problematic outcomes of assimilating? What is some of the problems posed by black muslim black communities people of color muslims arabs asians you name it those who make up the demographic majority of muslims that they come to the states canada europe wherever it may be and think right you know what let's just do as the romans do because you know what they've given us safe passage they're giving us good benefits they're giving us education employment opportunities some of this stuff's not even available in our kind of destabilized regions where we come from so in a in, in a show of gratitude that maybe we should do what they expect us to do. What's some of the problems, if any, is there with that mindset? Well, there is no doubt that there is some uh, there is some level of benevolence. There is some level of understanding that people are opening their doors and say, "Listen, these are our brothers in humanity. They should come in." But that should not be uh, a, a a condition for uh, taking away somebody's culture. What makes you a human being is these differences that we have, and the, what we can learn from each other is not actually to dissolve those. Uh, Allah says in the Quran, "Ya ayuhan nasu inna khalaqnaakum min dakarin wa unta wa jalnaakum shuba wa qabla." that you have been created into nations and tribes so and to different cultures and different experiences so you can bring those to one another and learn from one another and then the knowledge the collective knowledge of humanity will grow but if as soon as i see you everything about me goes down the drain and it's all about you that first of all is limiting our knowledge and it's also diminishing one part of population and that is why people degrade one another when we don't consider that the other person's culture uh, is is holds holds value all right so when uh, christopher columbus came uh, to this part of the world to to the americas and he returned again he said these people have no idea about how to deal with weapons if 50 of us could just colonize all of them with few weapons mm. right because he didn't think they they, they, they held any value and um this what the, the this is this is the, the 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 beginning of the subjugation of the native people mm. and when the people revolted and they, they understood the land and they were causing havoc to the to the colonizers they went to africa to get fresh hands and they brought them here and they went with weapons they kidnapped people and many of those were scholars and muslims and so on and brought them mm. and they they tried to make those people as because the people were keeping their religion they saw that as a threat yeah. And they wanted them to assimilate. But when they assimilated them, it's the wrong way as well. So there was a level of, we don't even want you to be like us. Mm. Because when they, when they Christianized them forcefully, mm. they didn't even allow them to pray in their churches. Mad. Because all they wanted was for them to worship a white God, really. Where, no, should, where should the white where should God, God that I represent? And, I look and like labor him. in the plantation. Exactly. So you worship in your church because you're going to worship a, a white god right so christianity was swiftly introduced but not because the white man wanted to share heaven with the black man otherwise you would have said let's worship in the same place mm -hmm. worship separately because it's just for you to see this white god whom i represent so that you stay subjugated mm -hmm. there is no other way of interpreting it for me mm -hmm. when you can tell somebody because come to my religion uh, and you don't even allow them to assimilate <laughs> Like, because assimilation means be like me and yeah, we are at the same yeah. level, right? I don't, even want to, I don't even want you to be the same. It, no, no, not even. Like, you can't stay what you are, but when you become something else, it's something lower than me. That's what happened in slavery. So it, was a, it, was a, it was a cultural human drain and subjugation of humanity. So, you know, you, you, you've alluded to quite clearly that there was uh, an element of, not element, um, an entire campaign of dehumanization. That's right. Uh, and would you say, now moving into the crux of today's podcast, would you say non-black Muslims, be it Arabs, less so Turks, but, but let's just stick to like non-black Muslims, mm -hmm. historically and even from a contemporary point of view, that they have actively whitewashed uh, the black experience and journey of Islam from Islamic history? I, 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 would, I would say so, yeah, that has happened a lot. Right. Um, the reason is, for some reason, when before Islam came, yeah. um, so slavery was going on in many, many parts of the world, in India, in, in, in Arabia, Central in Europe, all, 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 all over the place. 
And um, between the Arabs and the, and, the, and the black people, there was exchange of who's powerful, who's enslaving the other, because during the time of the year that the prophet was born, yeah. just giving you a background, uh, Yemen was under Ethiopia. Abraha, Abraha was, 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 was paying tribute and answering to the king of Ethiopia. So, so was Abraha an Arab or black man? Abraha was, a, was, a, was, was the representative of the Ethiopian. So he was in, the, Yemen. in Yemen, right? Because Yemen was, was part of yes. Ethiopia at yes, that yes, time. Yes, okay. So the Ethiopian empire was, was, was grand, right? Um, so when the prophet came, he, he, he materially ended slavery, right? Materially ended slavery. Uh, during the time of the Abbasid period, when people integrated again, this old Jahiliya, this ignorance started to manifest. If you look at the the the, the, the Arabian Nights, the one thousand and one nights, mm. this this very was famous. Yeah, it's very famous book where you have the Aladdin story yeah, and yeah. you have the, the genie in the yes, bottle and all yeah. of this, right? When it describes the black man, you see a description that was not in the time of the Sahaba, right? Give me an oh, like um, any time they talk about the black man, it's a black slave, Abd Aswad, Abd Aswad. So this thing reappeared again, right? Mm. Because with the Arabs. The slavery back and forth happened more between them and the black people, mm. right? And then even it even it even really touched the the ulama and the mufassirin, the ones that translated the Quran. To be frank, before we get to that, yeah. I'm really interested in that. Yeah. Why did you specify the Abbas, Abbas, Abbas are not the Umayyads? Be because 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 it may have started in the during the time about the, during the time of the Umayyads, but as time went on, then the ignorance started spreading because it went so far so that it became widespread, it became widespread more, okay. and there is more people accepting Islam coming with their 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 former ideas, mm. and not enough ulama to actually contain and spread proper Islam. Okay. Just like it's happening today, you have many Muslims, but you don't have the container to tell them what prop Islam proper is. Mm. So then, when you visited them after ten years, mm. you find this one is practicing different than the other, and everybody is bringing their cultural baggage into the din. So back to how you said Mufassir uh, and some ulama. Yeah. So when you read, for example, the story of Luqman, yeah. alayhi salam, right, whom um, many of them have said is not a prophet, but he has a whole surah in the Quran named after him. Uh, and and he is preaching the same thing that the prophets preached. Let's say he's not a prophet. They go into describing his physical structure as if they saw him, the size of his lips, <laughs> the size of his feet, you know, and how he looked and his color and so on. As if there is this fear of blackness has been introduced again to the people. I read a book uh, written by, I think it's, uh, I've forgotten, uh, it was written by a Pakistani um, uh, oh, you're scholar. Telling us about lunch, so. uh, uh, <laughs> yes, and <laughs> he was talking about uh, Bilal, that Bilal was a black man, but he actually wanted to minimize the blackness, <laughs> right? But he was not very dark. And he, so what if he was very dark? What is wrong with that? And when Musa, alayhi salam, yeah. when we talk about him as a prophet, who is the prophet described as, who is a prophet dark as a big dark complexion, yep. black person. Mm -hmm. And the Quran himself, the Quran itself said that uh, when he was sent to Pharaoh, one of his signs was his hand will become white. Mm. So if he puts it, he become white. This shows that the hand wasn't white before. Mm. And when you say by Allah in Arabic, whiteness means not necessarily whiteness of the paper. It could be whiteness of the human color. Mm. So that by that could mean white color. So he's that that hand would come instead of black color mm. to white color. Mm. So uh, every indication from the what Rasulullah said when he went to at the Miraj, at the Ascension, mm. and, and from uh, the Quran shows that Musa was a black person, but nobody mentions that, right? So um, everything has to be a little wider. So, right? so, he, so he's saying the omission or the minimal focus on this complexion, because I asked this to Sheikh Dawood Walid as well, yeah. for our viewers who watched the previous episode. But we didn't go into this too much because I yeah. preserved that for our conversation. That's right. So what makes you think that that omission is, was intentional? I, 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 don't, I don't think it's intentional. It comes out of the ignorance that had been, uh, had been portrayed because also the, 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 the belief in, in whiteness was not diminished. From many of from, from from many people, and um, the 
bringing that in, in, into Islam made them think that if something is white, it's better. And forgetting completely what the Prophet Sallallahu said in the longest sermon in his last days, after which only 81, 81 days he passed away mm. in Mount Arafah, mm -hmm. said, La fadla li arabiyan ala ajamiyan wa la li abiyad ala aswad wa la li aswad ala abiyad la Very detailed. He could have just said one sentence, we are all equal, but he said, there is no preference of an Arab over a non-Arab or non-Arab over an Arab. Then he went again, not black over white or white over black. So that's completely sufficient. Don't tell me uh, the, the tone of the, of the color any longer. So we're done with that, right? Bilal bin Rabah, he married to an elite family, the sister of Abdurrahman bin Auf, and also another woman from Syria. So during the time of the Prophet and the immediate generation after him, this problem didn't exist. It's amongst the Khulafa Rashidin. No, no, not at all. Not at all in the time of the Khulafa, not even in the time of the like Imam, Imam Malik and so on and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. So it's event it 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 uh, uh, very slowly crept into the into the psyche of the of the people again. Mm. Right, so this is what we have to deal with today. So, so looking at Islamic history, right, um, and, and, and I love Islamic history, but I would say I am absolutely guilty of not focusing uh, my uh, passion uh, towards the African region and even Mughal India, to be honest. And, and, and I would say that was, was where my ethnic mm -hmm. origins are from, yeah. from, from the Indian subcontinent. But I would say that, that perhaps the reason why that there is a nearly overwhelming focus on the Umayyads, mm -hmm. the Abbasids, and then the Ottomans is for two reasons. Reason number one is that these dynasties held the seat of Khilafa, the Islamic political institution, right. mm -hmm. uh, for centuries, mm -hmm. respectively. Mm -hmm. And number two, that they governed lands which are generally perceived as Islamic holy lands, Mecca, Medina, Jerusalem, Asham. So is there any fault in focusing in these three dynasties and the periods of these three dynasties of, let's say, rich Islamic civilizations out of African heritage or Indian heritage or non-Arab, and obviously the Ottomans were Turks. Mm -hmm. But could you understand why that there would be a focus in those three dynasties? It, it's, uh, to be frank with you, it's hard for me to understand because if you take um, if you take the 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 twelfth to thirteenth century around that time when Mansa Musa came into mm. power in West Africa, he went for his first first pilgrimage and he was a rich man and his empire was very rich. It was he his his, his um, allegedly uh, the Ma Mali Mali Empire, Mali empire. Uh, yes, uh, which came after the Ghana Empire, right after the Almoravids, allegedly the richest man that have walked the earth. So he went. He saw Muslims when he went for pilgrimage. He saw Muslims who are very low in their in their standard, standard of living, yeah. right? With, to his own standards, mm -hmm. that was very low. So he came the next year. He brought so much gold that there was inflation in Egypt and so on. Famous story. Yeah, and and you don't see this written very much. You don't see this taught in our schools. So, right. so where is that documented? Uh, no, that's documented in 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 the in the history books. Okay. That's documented in the history oh, books. It's not taught in, it it is not taught taught in okay. schools. Mm. It's not taught in schools, right? Uh, up till today, the the Ghana is called the Gold Coast, mm. right? The riches were there, and the people who were dealing in gold at that time still some of the tribes, including his own tribe, the Maringo people, they are still up till today mm. dealing in gold. That is their main business. That's the main focus, mm. right? So um, it was totally ignored. I don't know if it's the expansion of the empire that made it ignored, um, or if because the person who is ruling is not um, white enough, so he's not considered. I don't I really can't put my finger on it. Okay, so, so, so let, me, let me counter that to yeah. you then, yeah? Yeah. Personally as, personally, as someone who really is passionate about Islamic history, right? If someone said to me, because I, I do lecture on Ottoman history, right? I, I specifically chose this period as, as, as an area to self-teach myself, and if someone said to me, Diddy, why do you, why have you chosen the Ottoman period, the Ottoman dynasty? I have my reasons, but mainly because they were perhaps the closest manifestation and the last seat of the caliphate and the last encounter with Western powers that we had. So there's a lot to learn from them. That's my reason. Mm -hmm. But if someone said to me, the Indians, and by Indians, I mean the Mughals, yes. they never claimed to be caliphs. Uh, with, res with with exception to Salman Don Fodi on the Sokoto Caliphate, which came much later, right? No African dynasty or empire claimed the seat of the Khilafah. Nor did the Murabitun, nor did the Al Muahidun. None of them did. So, Khilafah and Caliphate being a central 
theme in Islamic uh, history because it's an institution which was perceived uh, even scripturally as something central to our religion. Why is it then unfair to then say that this is why they enjoy the lion's share of, of focus when it comes to Islamic history? Well, I don't. I, I think uh, the the Muslim history is not the Prophet sallallahu didn't predict that it's going to continue uh, as a as a uh, this beautiful uh, uh, utopian utopian uh, caliphate continuously. Right? He okay. told us how our history w it was going to be. Mm -hmm. So it's incumbent upon us to study our history overall. There is uh, even after way after Osman Danfodio in the nineteenth century when when the when the the the, uh, the French and the British came down, there was uh, uh, Imam Samori Turi. Have you ever heard about him? No. So Samori Turi was actually establishing an Islamic empire in the in the in in the in the in the southern part of, of West Africa, including Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire, and some parts of Mali. And he fought against the British and is captured. The, the British and the French, and he was captured, right? And his fight was he didn't want colonialism, and he wanted Islam to be part of, to be to be what will rule the people. Mm. So um, the history is there. I think I don't think that's a good that's good enough reason to ignore the rest of the the history. The Mughals we are not we are not caliphs, but their history is well documented, mm. right? This is true. Uh, uh, yeah, it's true. Comparatively, yeah, to comparatively, black, comparatively yeah. to black states and yeah. Emirates and this, definitely, it is, it is yeah. well documented. It is well documented. So you're so, you're so I'm you're suggesting that you start teaching West African history. Will you teach me, and will you send me the resources? You'll get, you'll, oh, you get resources. I think connecting that to how um, uh, uh, Islam between West Africa from the time Islam came there all the way to Islam coming over here mm -hmm. in, in in the Americas, I think it's an important history that we need to revive. Inshallah, I, <clears throat> I will make a level of commitment to research into this mm -hmm. area. But you're still maintaining that it's still the element of blackness which has resulted perhaps in the omission, the sideline, in the whitewashing of I totally, I totally believe that because if you read the books, you find that there is some fear of going. I don't know if I should call it a fear, but it's not, it's not the same approach. It's not the same approach. So it's blacked out after mentioning some few things, and usually, not those things are not always positive. At least not from the, not from the, the angle that a black person sees it. Right, mm. and um, the Muslims have not made enough effort. Even when, 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 when good or positive things are said about Muslim, about, about black people, Muslim or non-Muslim, it it has to come from either Africans themselves or from Europeans. The Muslims have not done ma made enough effort in that area. Good, that? Lo looking at the resources that we have, would, would, would you say? Black Muslims and African Muslims have done enough. Are they no, doing enough? no, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say they have. I wouldn't say they've done enough. Mm. I wouldn't say they've done enough. Well, well, the African Muslims are also guilty when it comes to concentrating because everybody goes with the trend. Mm. You see, it takes somebody to say no. This trend is 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 is, is going the wrong way. We have to reverse it, mm. right? So it's it's just like whoever is in power is what is who is what uh, everybody goes with. So if uh, if we say this is the strongest man in the world without doing any good research, everybody says that's the strongest man in the world. That's mm -hmm. just the way the world works. Mm -hmm. So we are not, we are all not researchers. But I think uh, this conversation itself is, um, is a moment of, of awakening and, and consciousness sure. to say we have to really uh, open up and know there is a, a, a segment of our society that has been neglected. Uh, and it's, it's, it's causing a lot of, um, it's causing anguish and it's, it's causing confusion. Mm. And it is, it, is, um, it is making people put more emphasis on African culture without Islam being part of, uh, uh, central to that. And that is problematic. That is big, that's big that time. That is majorly problematic. Yeah. So you, you yourself, in your family lineage and heritage, hail from Sierra Leone? Yes? Yes. But you told me a very interesting story about your tribe. Yes. Where they split three ways. Yes. Tell, tell us, please. So my, my great-grandfather, or his father, yeah. uh, moved from Mali, yeah. uh, came to sell horses, yeah. and uh, stationed in a place called Manda. And uh, I think whether I came with family or married there, I don't, I don't know. But then his children... Uh, three of them each took their family. One stayed there. The other one went to a place to a full a majority Fulani place, and the other one went to another place. So three of them separated, and the other two were in contact. The other one they were not in contact with them until later on. So then my 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 parents later on uh, in 1956 uh, moved to Sierra Leone, mm. where uh, we were born.
Um, now, now Sierra Leone, Guinea, and all of these boundaries are some things that were imposed by the by the colonial powers. Mm. People used to be nations and people that ruled themselves. They had their kings and mm. so on and so mm. forth, right? So um, the boundaries are very blur uh, to, to me. Mm. So you call me Guinean, I, 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 I will answer. You call me Malian, I will answer. Mm. But I identify as a Sierra Leone because that's where I was born. That's where I was educated. That's mm. why. I, that's where I know my father and my mother. Mm. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so our people are uh, originally from Mali, mm. and that's where the Mandane people come from, generally, okay. which that's I belong that, to. That's what you belong to. Yeah. yeah. If you could tell our viewers and listeners, a uh, couple of dynasty states, emirates, empires, civilizations that were Black, African, or Muslim to look into and read into, what would you suggest? I would really I would suggest a few. I want people to look into uh, what happened in the West Indies and the role of the Muslims in fighting the British because there is there is this message that's been given to us that the person who was trying to enslave them was the one who also gave them the weapons to free themselves mm. abolitionists no actually the people fought and there is uh, there are evidence coming out that many of these people actually had either strong Islamic connection or were Muslim themselves and led the fight especially in Jamaica in Jamaica? In Jamaica itself, right? So that th th that is one. Samori Touré, right? So, is, so it wasn't white abolitionists who gave the Th weapons. There is no way they would have wanted the they, they would have wanted uh, uh, the, the the slavery to finish. Mm. So they went into signing agreement between themselves and the Maroons, mm. right? Who were fighting against them. And one of the things actually they said in some of the, those agreements is that um, if anyone who is not part of you left their our plantations and come to you, you have to return them back to us. <laughs> <laughs> so that is not that is that is not the suggestion in a pact of someone who wants to give you freedom, mm. right? Pretty much, you say we can't fight you anymore. We know you're strong enough, so we want to negotiate with you. But you know, keep the people you have now. But please, if some more people come to you, yeah. you have to return them. Let's sign that. So the anti-British resistance in the West Indies. To look into that. Yeah? Look into that. It's very, it's very important. So, so Muslims play a key role. In yeah, exactly, and also um, the, the the number of Muslims that came here that were enslaved, and how they they conducted themselves. Now, new research is coming out, and documentaries are coming out of people writing their own autobiography in Arabic. Mm about how they were kidnapped and forced into christianization in the in, in the americas oh, right so today in my in my lecture i showed one of those in a video um this is in the in the in the library of congress now this uh, somebody owned this document uh, privately yeah. of this man who was 37 years old 37 years old kidnapped and brought over and um muslim forced, muslim forced yeah because Muslims were using the Arabic language to write, West Africans were using the Arabic language to write their own mother tongues. Okay. I, 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 in my generation, before the, fo the, fo the, fo the, the, cell the phones came, came along, I used to write to my father using Arabic script. Allah. Right? Wow. In my language, because my father cannot speak Arabic, but he, he knows how to use the script. So that was very popular. Wow. How, that's how deep Islam was with the people. Nobody talks about that. Right. Ghanaian Empire, the Mali Empire. Ghani Empire, the Mali Empire. We need to study uh, a little bit more about uh, uh, Usman Danfodi's empire mm. and uh, Samori Touré mm. uh, in, 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 the, in that, um, the, the, the Gulf of Guinea area. And, it's, right. and, and, it's, and, and you're, you're stating that Islam played a central role in all these dynasties. Islam, ha Islam was central. When Islam came, he found the Africans. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that illa khala fiha nadir. there are not any people that did not have a warner, meaning a messenger. Mm -hmm. There's a remnant of some belief in the creator, in the Africans, and also living naturally. Naturally doesn't mean just living on the earth, but also seeing things uh, the way, the, the way the, there is balance. So when Islam came, Africans found it very easy to reconcile the message of Islam mm. with, what, with, with what they believed already. So some things were, were not in, 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 in par, so they cut those, mm. but many of the things were, were, were easy for them to accept. Mm. So, um, so they accepted Islam, and the kings accepted Islam first, before the masses, right? And 
when when the, when the traders came, the Arab traders, and if there was was conflict and they went to the court, they had their court system and all that. This is Ghana Empire, mm. right? And they employed the Arabs to write to take court court proceedings because they had a, a, a writing system. And um, the friendship started, and they saw the din, and they accepted it. And the elite were Muslims mm. before the masses. But what they didn't do was for to force that on the people, and people started accepting Islam on their own because people would follow their chiefs generally, mm. right? They believed in respecting whoever is the elder and whoever we've, they've conferred power onto. And this is how it spread. Can I ask you a, a, another question? Why is, is, is there a kind of uh, conception or misconception that the Fulani people and even the Somali people, they are like Arabized blacks? No, no, they are not Arabs. Their language, so, so, so. Um, so Have you so, heard this before? I, a lot. A lot. A lot. So you find you find so they are they are closer to the north. So from the, from West Africa all the way to to East Africa, around the two the two edges of the Sahara Desert, yeah. you find people who nomads who who care about cattle, yeah. who move from place to place looking for water and so on. Mm. But that is the life that has been that that that's all that's there. Mm. And now many of those they have same same features, right? But if you go down, you find Fulani's. Uh, as you go south, you find Fulanis as well, right? Um, but they are not Arabs because the, the structure of their language itself. So why does that exist? Why does this conception be it, 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 it exists because many of them accepted Islam earlier. And up till very recently, you cannot find a Fulani that is not a Muslim. So the overwhelming majority are Muslim. But that happens to the Maringo as well. Okay. I personally, hmm. I don't know any Maringo person. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. Who says I'm other than Muslim? They're overwhelmingly Muslim as well. Uh, yeah, I don't even like if you go hundred mm. percent, you may be right because there is not one percent that wh whoever says is not Muslim is not up to one percent. Okay, right? So they are not alone in that. Okay. But the Maringos also, um, um, uh, so the features is mixed really. You say a Fulani person, if he tells you Maringo, sometimes you may you may believe, but because there are there are intermarriages mm. now, people's their features develop mm. we have we have adaptation and so on and so forth and there is no doubt there was mix there was mixing as well mm. when the people moved down and they, they, they there was trust between them mm. and and the locals and they started working together because actually the arabs that came that time um, they came with a lot of uh, integrity mm. so there are stories of somebody coming and taking uh, some merchandise mm. and saying i'll pay you next season mm. And the other person who's the African saying, no problem. And they will go. And if they come and they found that person gone, la lost, dead, something, they will go looking for them. Maybe found the family and say, I owe, I owe that relative of yours this much. So, yeah, so people were impressed, mm. right? Yeah. Um, and people, someone will give you anything for that. Oh, right. right. So uh, those were good days. Mm. Good, the good days. <laughs> those were very good days, you know. Now you studied in Pakistan. I, yeah. Why are you bringing that up? <laughs> <laughs> because, no, because it's interesting. It's partly yes. It yes, I did. I, I, I did. I, 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 Okay, fine. Yeah, I did. I studied in Pakistan. Okay. Period. I did. Yes. For, Bring it up. For how long? Uh, uh, for six years. I got my first degree there, and I got my my first masters there. Inshallah. Yeah. And uh, Urdu both of you? I Torah. Okay. Torah. Te, yeah. And and did you see some of this fascination, racism, regressive behavior, whatever you want to call it? Did, yeah. you, did you see you know, any of you that? You know. You know. You know. I find it difficult to call it to call uh, to call it racism. Well, well, part part of it is, is that because fascination? racism, fascination is that because racism is the belief that one race is better than the other. So fascination. But it could be subconscious. It could be subconscious. So, sometimes our racist true. racial stereotypes are subconscious. That's we true. We don't even know it. And that is true it, you know? because that's where I read the book where the man said that Bilal wasn't very black. Was this a scholar, by the way? Uh, I don't know if he was a scholar. I've forgotten the name of the writer. But so, so for you to feel like it is hard for me to make Bilal black, yeah. that is a problem, <laughs> right? Okay. If Bilal was anything other than black, <laughs> then we were talking about something else, right? And this was the person the Prophet wasalam, said about, I, 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 I heard his footstep in Jannah ahead of me. Subhanallah. Right? It can't be any better than that. Right. So yeah, in Pakistan, there was a lot of, I would call it ignorance. So people will come very close to you, like looking at you, really being 
they are really trying to hold themselves not to touch you, to see whether you really are, you know, what is happening. Is this machine or human being? <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. Yeah, so funny, funny. So if, if two or three black people are standing, right. in five minutes, they'll be surrounded by people yeah. all over, and they'll be standing there and looking, <laughs> looking at you like this, right? And, and it came to a point that we'll just ignore them and just do what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, people have a lot of time in their hands because they don't go to work <laughs> nine to five. <laughs> and uh, was that consistent for six years? Um, yeah, I, 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 I must say. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I must say. And, and, and something funny was happening. They were seeing the, the movie Roots. Have okay. you seen it? No. Uh, Roots is the story of Kunta Kinte. Have you heard that? Heard yeah, yeah. So the story it, it was it was um, uh, created in, 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 as, as a movie, okay. and um, that was a wrong movie to show okay. in Pakistan. It didn't help. Yeah, it, didn't, yeah. <laughs> it didn't help, right? Maybe Black Panther would yeah. have <laughs> would have been better. <laughs> Not Roots. Not Roots. No. Not Roots. Did you enjoy Pakistan? Though? I did. Um, there was a lot of. Um, um, a lot of good things to say. Um, so I'll tell you a very, very story that may touch you, um, or maybe you may say this and that. When I, when I, when I landed in Pakistan, I had passed through England, and I didn't have a visa because the embassy was in Ghana, and they told me, "Oh, you don't need to go to and when go, go when you arrive at the airport, they will give you a visa." Yes. And when I came to England, they told me they wouldn't allow me to go through to to use England to go to Pakistan when I didn't have a visa. I showed them all kinds of documents, my acceptance and so on. So I spent a day or two there, and every single penny I got was, was I spent everything. I was left with one pound, which I kept with me, stayed hungry, said, when I know I I'm going, then I will buy coffee and drink. So right Yes. So I landed in Pakistan with nothing. And as soon as I came out, the taxi drivers started coming to me. Come, come, yeah, come, come, come. So people trying to negotiate, I told them, I don't have money. Right? So I wonder, how are you going to get where you're going? I said, I'm calling the university and they're going to pick me up. So one guy told me that, oh, don't worry, I'll take care. And, and, and then he took me in his taxi and a couple of kilometers, he stops. He pulls over and says, my car charges $100. So I said, I told you I don't no, have money. Million rupees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dollars. Yes. Dollars. Oh, yeah, yeah. I said, I told you I didn't have money. He said, you think I'm crazy? And I was a young man then. I didn't know what I was dealing with. I said, and you think I'm crazy? <laughs> so um, he took me back. And then another man who had promised would take me, but I didn't listen to him, came to me and said, what happened? I told him, he said, I told you to wait here. And he took me uh, to the university. He went, he went to one university first. Yeah. That was the wrong one. He went to the other one and he stopped me at the door. They said, yes, this is the right place. And he shook my hand. He gave me his number. He said, anything you need here. Give me a call, you know. May Allah bless, Allah bless him. So that really touched me. That was my first experience, right? So the this one balanced the other one, right? <laughs> it was a balancing act. That Did happened. you find similarities to African Sierra Leone? Oh, so so one thing you will find with Africans, I believe, everywhere, east, west, north, south, mm. is um, uh, if you show up as a stranger anywhere in the world, people want to exploit you. Mm. But when somebody wants to host you, they give you everything. Mm. And um, they keep you for as long as you need, mm -hmm. for as long as you need them. If they know you really are, are, are needed, it's just part of uh, the African culture mm -hmm. uh, that you, the, so the generosity is just enormous. Did you see any of that in Pakistan? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, definitely, definitely. There's a lot of that. There was a lot of that um, among people. People people are good in their core. Would you ever revisit? Um, you know what? I, I don't have the resources. Otherwise, I would love to see how Karachi has turned out. Okay. It was very, it was very troublesome then. Uh, the war was going on in Afghanistan, and, yeah. and there was a lot of um, uh, political turmoil and uh, yeah. killings and strikes, and so many things were happening. It was scary. Do you think the people still touch you when you go there? Do I? Do you think people will still touch you when you go there? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I maybe maybe it's better nowadays because when we were there. People before us told us that actually they used to take uh, little pebbles and throw it at them and see how they would react. <laughs> so, so, so it was actually it had improved when when we went <laughs> so we from throwing something. Yeah, from throwing like, to just, just yeah, yeah, to just to yeah, to just let me touch on one side. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's really surprising. <laughs> but you know, life is life is like that. Sure.
Yeah. It was an absolute honor. Zakallah. Barakallah fiq. Allah bless you. May Allah bless you too, ya khay. And please, please visit us in the UK. Inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah. May Allah bless you. Barakallah fiq. I mean, you know, brothers and sisters, and that is all for today's podcast, for today's episode. Please share this video, like it, leave a comment uh, for our viewers and listeners from the North of America, meaning North America. Uh, subscribe to the Mad Mumbuk channel. For those of you watching from the Muslim world, uh, from Europe, from the UK, uh, subscribe to the Five Pillars channel. A big shout out again to the five MSAs, uh, SFU, uh, UBC, uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta and Royal Mountain Calgary. A big shout out to you all. And Regina. And Regina, that's it. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> For all of you getting together and organizing United Islam Awareness Week, may Allah accept it from you all. Amen. Amen. And until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalamu wa barakatuh. Blood Burma's podcast. Five Pillars of Mad Monolith Production.